repeated and everything that way communicating well. Uh, one of them being that in the month of April, at the end of the month, I'd like to do a lunch fellowship. Uh, we had to miss the last one because of Easter and uh, trying to plan them out. The next one won't be until later, closer to summertime. So I thought April would still be a good month to maybe try to sneak one in. And so if you'll uh, just take notice in your mind for the last week in April, and it will be in the bulletin this week that you, uh, we'll plan a, a luncheon to have after service with everyone being able to enjoy. Again, we had a great attendance for Easter, and I appreciate all the work that as a church family you did. I know many of you got several tracks out. Hopefully all of us got at least one out, and the participation in doing that is obviously how God works and how God blesses. And so I hope that you were diligent in that and appreciate the effort that you did make. Tonight, if you'll turn with me to the book of John in chapter number four is where we'll have our attention this evening. And I do not really have a, a title or maybe a special introduction of how to uh, bring this about. Obviously, John chapter three, or I'm sorry, John chapter four, the early verses are dealing with what we have talked about in the past in regards to uh, the woman at the well. And so if you're familiar with that story, that's very good. That'll help us tonight. If you're not familiar with it, it is God who makes a journey from Jerusalem up to Galilee. And if you're not familiar with it, Judea is going to be down here in the southern part of Israel. Galilee is going to be the northern part. And obviously what's here in the middle is just a small section of people known as the Samaritans. The Samaritans were kind of a mix of Jews and Greeks who came together. And obviously when it came to the Hebrew or the purest of a Jewish thinking, uh, specifically those that would be Pharisaical and, and uh, holding to the law and that sort of thing, they would look at the Samaritans saying, hey, your family left God, your family intermixed with races, and your family did what they weren't supposed to do. And so in all of that, where God is saying it's not an interracial thing, it is obviously keeping the laws of God clean and pure. And when you mixed with the cultures, you took a little of this and a little of that and you put it together and said, hey, this is how we're going to worship God. And God said for the Samaritans, that was not a good thing. The Jews looked at it and said, we don't want anything to do with it. And so it divided the Jews. The really holistic, the really purest ones lived south in Judea. The ones that were not so pharisaical but still believed in God lived up in Galilee. And God said, I want to go from Jerusalem to Galilee. And so we're going to pass through Samaria. And he says, I must needs go through Samaria. The reason of that need was, of course, this woman at the well. God wanted to meet her. And so a phenomenal story of how God says, hey, I'm, I'm going to make time for you. I'm going to make time for this relationship. I want to answer your questions, even if you're the only woman from Samaria who comes and sees me. Well, we come in, tag into the bottom part of that story in our study tonight. John chapter 4, and verse number 31 here the Bible says, In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. In other words, they came to him after they had gone into the city to get some, some meat, and they said, Master, it's been a long trip. We're out here in the middle of nowhere. It's desert country. You need to eat something. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, have any man brought him ought to eat? Did someone else bring him food while we were away? It's kind of the question there. Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor other than men labored, or other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. 
So when the Samaritans were come unto him, Jesus, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Amazing, just by way of thought, that God says, I'll hang out with you for a couple days, when most people said, I want nothing to do with you. And many more believed because of his own word. And he said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Amazing passage. A lot being said here, and a lot being uh, easily something that we can lo- get lost with. But as long as we keep following God's train of thought here, I hope tonight it will really be an encouragement and a blessing to you. As we look at the message and look at what Jesus is trying to teach us, the beginning part here seems to be like a meal preparation. He talks about my meat. And obviously in his his addressment of that, it's really more of an illustration because no one's eating anything. The disciples apparently got some meat. and Maybe they've already uh, picked up some beef jerky at the 7-Eleven in Samaria or a Sychar, I should say, Shechem. Uh, But the reality is we don't see anybody in this part of the passage sitting down, cooking a meal, and saying, here's the preparation of everything that we had planned. Instead, what we see is Jesus says, hey, you may offer me meat, you may have some meat, but what the meat is that I have or the nourishment that I have is not physical. It's not something of this world. I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Stop and think with me for a moment as you fill in the blank in your notes here. We see the controlled focus of our attention. The controlled focus of our attention. Who's the one who's talking about meat here? Is it? Stop and think again. Is one person. It's just Jesus. Jesus is saying, my meat, this meat, the meat I'm about to tell you about. This is the subject matter that he's trying to communicate. And in the awareness of this meat, Jesus is the only one who's aware of it. And so there's maybe 12 disciples here. There's several disciples. There's obviously other characters who have the potential. But Jesus says, let me tell you about meat you don't even know about. As he uses this term, my meat, Jesus was captivated by the needs of others. We could say this, Jesus was controlled by the needs of others.
who's coming to the well where Jesus is. And at some point, they probably had to meet. They probably had to cross paths. And you say, well, Pastor, aren't there a lot of cities in the area? Actually, biblical times, there wasn't. Jerusalem was 30 miles south. Samaria, another city after that area, is about six miles west. And so Sychar, Shechem, is the only city to go get food. And so they had to have crossed paths at some point. But here the disciples say, hey, it's, it's hidden to us. We don't get it. How about this thought? Could it be hidden to them? Because they're just so busy. Everyone's busy in their own mind. Everyone's busy about things that they have to do, what they want to accomplish. Getting God food was the priority to them. But obviously not the priority to the bigger picture, is it? Because God saw the bigger picture. He said, I'm going to wait here at the well to speak to this woman. You could wait with me, but you decided to go into the city and get some food for everybody. Not a wrong thing, just not the thing that God was focused on. And so I'm pointing all these things out and helping us see it because even in our day today, what are things that keep God's focus from us? A lot of the same things. Hey, Pastor, I can't go do that activity with the church this week because I'm busy. Doing what? Well, just busy stuff. Busy stuff for my schedule. Busy stuff for my life. It's not my priority, but it is God's. Well, you know, God will understand. I'll I'll make it up the next time. I'll, I'll do it another time. I'll be involved some other way. There's a lot of thoughts and a lot of things that we can excuse ourselves from and not all bad. But my point is, is that many times we can excuse ourselves from doing the very thing that God says, hey, this is my meat. This is what's necessary. This is what brings nourishment. Don't let it be something hidden from you. So whether it be door knocking or soul winning, sharing the gospel, being a teacher or nursery worker, just realize all of those responsibilities, God says, hey, This is what brings refreshment. Jesus was satisfied to do the will of God. But I also want us to see Jesus did the will of God while he was very weary or tired. They went and got him food for a reason. And even in that reason where he would think he could quit, he could give up, he could take a breather, God still said, no, I want to do the will of God. So there really is no excuse for us tonight that even in the aspect of taking those breaks to ever step away completely and say that I don't need to do that. I don't need to participate in that. I don't need to serve God that way. When we think of this phrase or the simple statement that God makes, my meat, let me ask you tonight, what is a good plate of food to you? How would you describe a good dinner tonight? If I said, hey, there's a good... Uh, dinner there's a good placement that's going to be put on the dinner table what would be a a a menu item you might think on it would you think a porterhouse steak some of us ribeye okay ribeye steak spaghetti would be another thing on the plate what else would be on the menu mashed potatoes and gravy okay and so we see very plainly as we take a poll here there's a lot of different food to a lot of different people that's very tempting for this sort of thought And so as God says, hey, I've got a plate set up for you. I've got a remedy for you. I've got something here for you. God is saying the meal's already there. You and I can't look at our plate and say, well, I don't want that and push it off. That's not what I expected. God, that's not what I wanted. We have to stop and realize if God's put the plate on the table, then that food is what God expects me to eat. And that food is what I apparently need to eat for my nourishment. For that spiritual response. And you say, well, Pastor, is God actually giving me a ribeye steak or mashed potatoes? Or if it's like me, is God putting dessert on the table? No. He's obviously not talking about the physical part. But what he is wanting us to understand is that our appetites many times are different than what God wants us to participate in. Food, very plainly tonight, can be for gluttony. Or it can be for nourishment. What makes the difference? Portions and appetite is what determines the difference. Am I a glutton tonight for having a ribeye? No. If I have 10 ribeyes, <laughs> might be a problem there. Am I, uh, am I wrong in, in having a glutton for, for obviously dessert? Maybe. But also it's the understanding if this is the only thing you're going to eat, 
What is your appetite tonight? There are things that God wants to feed us spiritually that are good for our life, that are nourishing, that will strengthen us. But if we're saying, God, I don't want what you offer. I want what the world has to offer. There's something wrong with that desire. You say, well, Pastor, how can we apply that thinking to our lives right now? We're obviously not at a dinner place. We're not eating food. Let me ask you this then. Are things in our life a little out of proportion from recent months? In other words, we're coming off winter. It's the slow time. It's the hunker time. It's the time which we just batten down the hatches and stay within our homes because it's warm. And we don't necessarily go out. We aren't super friendly. There's a lot of things about our winter schedule as a person that's not the same as our summer schedule. And so maybe tonight it would be wise to say, hey, springtime's coming, summertime's coming. The church is getting involved. There's some events that are planned. There's some things that are happening. I need to make sure that my thinking is I want to help rather than looking at it like, eh, I'll back up because that's really not me. No, our thinking should be if this is what God wants, if this is the, the work of God, if this is what ministry requires, then I need to be involved. And I need to change my schedule, change my thinking, change my patterns so that it's proportion to bring health and nourishment into my life. You cannot live this life, as the Bible says it, man will not live or cannot live, shall not live by bread alone. Do we live by bread? Absolutely. But what God is also trying to point out is their spiritual responses, not just physical bread to keep you alive. There's also spiritual responses that keep you spiritually alive. If we aren't doing spiritual things, even if it's sitting in a pew and not connecting, not listening, but just saying, I'm here, I'm doing my time, I'm putting in my effort. If we aren't participating in the work of God, we're robbing ourselves of spiritual (coughs) nourishment. And let's be honest, there's a lot of anemic Christians in our world. And if they are anemic, it's not because of the church, always. It's not because of the messages, always. Sometimes it's just personal to us. We're not doing what God's wanting us to do. So we've got to answer that question. We've got to look within our own hearts and our own lives and say, Lord, is this what you're talking about? Is this what you want for my life? And perhaps, God, I need to change some of my thoughts and my patterns and my activities from recent months so that I can have that spiritual nourishment I need. Let her be in your notes tonight. Another way in which God, the controlled focus of our attention is seen. Jesus says not only is there an emphasis on the meat that I'm being nourished by, but he also uses this phrase, that we are to finish or Jesus wanted to finish his work. Not his own work, but in verse 34, it says, my need is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. There is a work to be finished tonight. There's a work in building a church. There's a work in seeing the gospel go forth. There's a work in ministry that God wants everyone to have a participation on. And we see it very plainly that it even involves Jesus. The one who created the world. The one who should be able to sit on a throne and say, hey, I'm done. It involves him. Jesus, because he says, I want to finish his work, tells us he's on a commission. Someone commissioned him to do a work. Jesus was surrendered to the work outside of his own. And so God says, hey, I I want to finish the work that I've been sent here to do. And it may not be all about me, but it is a work I want to accomplish. And I want to be surrendered to what God would need from me. And then Jesus in human form, in uh, earthly flesh, just the reality is that Jesus wanted to finish. I've been studying this week for Sunday school, and I'm excited about Sunday's lesson, but I just want to make a, a, a little quip here so I don't spoil everything. How many would agree with me it's much easier to quit something than it is to finish? The reality is it is. And as we see that happen even more and more so in our world, here's the point. Jesus says, no, no, I don't want to quit. 
I don't want to spin my wheels. I don't want to just be proactive in this. I want to finish it. Jesus says, I'm going to spend my life finishing what the will of God was. Now, how does he finish it? Obviously, it's the cross of Calvary. Because why? God at that moment says, it is finished. He accomplished the work God meant for him to do. And so it's a blessing for us to see that. It's a blessing for us to know that. That whatever work God gives us can be finished. But it requires us to be involved. It requires us to be people who say, I want to finish the work. I don't want to quit the work. I don't want to postpone it. I don't want to just kind of let it die out. I want to finish it. I hope you and I tonight would be people who would say, you know, God, I I don't know how to finish. I don't know what to finish. But I do want to be a Christian who finishes. Number two in your notes, not only do we see a controlled focus of our attention. My meat. Look here. Number two, we see a captivated focus. Verse 35 He says here, say ye not that there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. After that word harvest, what do you see there? Isn't it a question mark? It's not a period. God's not making a statement here. He is asking a question in verse number 35. Hey, disciples, those that are listening to me, those that just went and got some food, those that just returned. Say ye not, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? The picture is this. Don't most people say right now, hey, harvest time's coming, but it's four months away. We've got time to do whatever we want with the four months we have. God is saying, you're living your life as if you still got plenty of time. But you know, the reality is tonight, many of us would admit, life is short. We never have the time that we want. We never have all the time we expect. We never have everything that we'd like to see come about. And a harvest proves that. Why? Because what we think should be a harvest time sometimes comes early, sometimes comes late, sometimes doesn't come at all. But the harvest is not something we should put off. The danger of the disciples was that there was no hurry as the culture of the day unfolded. How many, when you're walking or driving through the street of North Bend or Coos Bay, how many have ever come to an intersection and someone's walking through the crosswalk or perhaps they're crossing the street where there is no crosswalk and they go across the street as if they own the road? You know, they kind of walk like that and and the slow pace, and they're kind of looking around at things, and then as they're looking around at things, maybe they drop something in the middle of the road, so they stop to pick it up, oh, okay, let's stretch here, oh, okay, there's all these cars waiting on me, and finally, oh, there's the end of the street, and you're just counting the moments that they would step on the curb so you can turn, and they're like, oh, I'll just get to the curb eventually, all right, and then I'll walk off. See, I was always brought up as a kid that if you had some place to go, if you had something to do, if someone asked you to do something, move with purpose. I get agitated when I see somebody take 30 hours to cross the crosswalk. It doesn't mean they have to run. It doesn't mean I'm uh, uh, pointing fingers at maybe disabilities or other reasons. I'm just saying when I see a healthy 15-year-old take 30 hours to cross the street, there's a problem there, amen? My, my blood gets up a little bit. I get agitated saying, hey, could you not move a little quicker? My activities, my effort, and others that are behind you are waiting on you. We're not trying to say we're better than you. We're just trying to say, come on, let's move this thing along. God is saying the same thing in this thought here. The harvest is ready, and you're acting like you got four months. Let's move this thing along. Let's get active. Let's participate. Let's be involved. Let's not say, you know, I've done my part or or, or it's not time for me to jump in yet or these things don't affect me. No, they do for the disciples because God gives them some actions to respond with. What is first action? Well, look at letter A there in your notes. He says, lift up your eyes. A harvest does not wait, so lift up your eyes and look at it. If I have to lift up my eyes, what's the problem? 
I'm looking down at my feet. I'm looking down at what's right in front of me. I'm caring about the immediate rather than being responsive to the bigger issues. Lift up your eyes. If you've ever seen a fruit tree where it hasn't been cared for and the fruit is hanging on the tree and it's all over on the ground and even some of the fruit has become rotten, it's a horrible picture to see. Why? Because a fruit tree, if there's fruit on it, should be healthy. It should be ready to grab. It should be available. It should be something where you just say, that's a pretty sight. But when it's brown and mushy and gross and all the fruit at the bottom of the trees began to rot, there's an aroma that you just say, that's not how it's supposed to be. And God is saying the same thing here. Lift up your eyes because what should be a beautiful picture is rotting. Because no one's picking it up. No one's being involved. No one's participating letter b challenges them to look on the fields look on the fields well, to look on the fields means get in the game be involved go out to the field start picking something be a worker now, i'm thankful as a pastor within our church that many of you just like myself get to lead people to the lord I'm thankful that as a pastor, as I greet people at the door or get to shake hands with them, I see many of you doing the exact same thing. Why is that exciting? Because all of us are workers. You know, not all of us in a harvest field are the owner who gets the benefit of the fruit. When we think of a harvest field, there's people who water, there's people who put out dirt, there's people who plant, there's people who do this job, there's people who do that job. And there's many different responsibilities done by lots of different people. But when the harvest comes in, when the fruit is gleaned, everybody's excited. It's the same thing as a church. And we all get excited when someone gets saved, whether they're young or old. We're all excited as we got to see people astir the baptistry. You did not get wet. I got a little wet. But it was exciting for them to obviously find a church family, become part of a church home and be able to rejoice with us. There's many things that as a church, we minister together. But here's the issue. You've got to get involved for it to be exciting. People say, well, Pastor, it's just really not you know, my thing. It's really not exciting. It's really not something that's stirring my soul. Maybe it's because you're not participating. Maybe because it's not getting involved. Maybe because it's not a, a sacrifice or an effort or a, a time restraint. And we're thinking things should be different. But we're outside the harvest just staring at everybody else. Let her see. There's a reward for working. A reward for working or a reward for our labors. Verse 36, and it says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Somebody's going to plant, somebody's going to water, somebody's going to harvest. But everybody rejoices. But here's the point of 36. You get a reward if you work. But if you don't do the work, if you don't participate, if there's no effort for the disciples, if there's no sharing the gospel, if there's no door knocking, if there's no keeping the church doors open, if there's no effort of sacrifice and giving, then there's no reward. Jesus, as he tells them to look up and see that everything, the harvest is already white. He's telling them that you should work, expect, expecting a blessing because if you'll go out there and pick the harvest is already white it's ready to be picked you just have to go get it for yourself letter d tonight there's an agreeable rejoicing your work is rewarded so do the work however it's required Number two, the good fruit of your labor lasts forever. And every worker rejoices equally. 
So if there's an agreeable rejoicing, if there's a, an excitement that both for the sower and the reaper is worth doing the labor, then there's really no excuse we have for not participating. The last part of this study tonight is simply this, the condition focus. The condition focus. Verse 39, if you read it with me, it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So her testimony affected the city. So when the Samaritans were come unto Jesus, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed on his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Verse 38, Jesus tells the disciples, I sent you. Well, so, if you sent us, what does that mean? Then he gives us the illustration. I sent the woman at the well to go back into the city. I sent her to go get her husband. She didn't have a husband. The man she was with was not her husband. But I sent her, and as she obeyed and went back into the city, she told others what I had told her. She told others, come see the Christ. Come see for yourself. And as she said, come see for yourself, a city was changed. This is my point. That as a disciple, God has sent you and me. You know Christ is your Savior. We aren't here to twiddle our thumbs. We aren't here to build our 401ks. We aren't here to have a big house or big car, all sorts of other things. And those things are not wrong. But God says, go back to where you get nourished. Go back to the thing that I want you to do. And if you make that your focus, if you make that your attention, if you let that control your life, then even though you have a nice house, even though you have a car, even though you have this or have that, if you let this be your focus, you will always remember, I need you and I've sent you for this purpose. As a Christian, we can get so easily sidetracked in life's dilemmas that we no longer are profitable in the thing that God sent us for in the first place. God says, don't worry about your problems. Don't worry about other things. And they are issues and they are concerns, but God knows about them. But don't live your life as if you're free to do whatever you please without recognizing God sent you and me and gave us a commission and gave us a responsibility. And until we finish that task, our lives are not our own. Letter B, he says also, ye are entered. He uses that statement as he speaks of... Um, Verse 38 at the end of it. And ye are entered into their labors. We reap from seeds we did not sow. And I love it as a church. When I get to see one of our kids or one of our adults or somebody accept Christ as their Savior, I didn't knock on their house. I don't know if you did. But what a blessing to know that somebody did. Somebody reached out to them. Someone sent them a card. Someone invited them for an Easter service. Someone did something. And we reap from the seeds we do not sow. But if we're not there reaping, we will not glean. So we've got to be consistent in having our doors open. We've got to be consistent in loving people. Never growing weary in well-doing. And then let her see. We see the final result. If we do what God asks, what does verse 41 say? And many more believed because of his own word. How many would like to have many more within your church tonight? How many would like to have many more within your pew? How many would like to have many more help with the responsibility of what a ministry requires? I would love all that. But the point is, until someone participates, many more will never come Many more cannot believe. Many more won't happen. And so I've got to be a door knocker just like you. 
I've got to invite people just like you. I've got to take the time to share the gospel just like you. I've got to sacrifice just like you. I've got to pray. I've got to read the Bible. I've got to do things just like you. Because it's the meat that God has given to us to participate in. I hope tonight you can say, Pastor, if God looked at me, he wouldn't say, you don't know the meat that I'm eating. I hope he would say, no, he knows, I know exactly the meat you're eating because I had a plate of it myself just yesterday. I had a menu of it just last week. I had some mashed potatoes and gravy, but I also had some spiritual food because I know that is what my purpose, my commission, and I'm doing just what my Lord and Savior himself had to do as well. Lord, as we come to you tonight, building a work for you, building a family, building a church, building spiritual strength, God, we see tonight that it does require effort, but we've got to look up, we've got to see it, and we've got to realize the harvest is in front of us, not beneath us. It's not in our own feet, in our own shoes, Lord, it is all around us. And unless we're participating and being a reaper and going out, then Lord, no one's catching those people, no one's inviting those people, no one's finding them. And there's many more that are not believing because of it. Lord, may that not be because of our fault. Lord, may we be Christians tonight. May we be individuals tonight who would accept the responsibility and not let it be our only thing. But Lord, may it be the one thing that we keep our focus and keep within our mind. Perhaps tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed, you'd say, you know, Pastor, it, it do have sort of that winter slumber. I do have sort of that frozen mindset where kind of the things of my life that I normally do have not kicked into gear yet. Normally I'm inviting people and normally I'm encouraged and normally I'm trying to share the gospel. But I kind of still am coming out of my hibernation. And I need God's help and I need a reminder that these are good things every Christian should be doing, but I need to be the Christian myself who's doing them if tonight you'd say pastor that's me that's how i stand before god i i don't do it like i used to i don't do it like i should i haven't been doing it for a winter maybe tonight you just simply say to god lord help me to start tonight help me to start now help me to start this year because somebody is needing you to reach them that's a hard thing to think, but the reality is God says no one will if you and I don't put effort. That means my effort, as much as your effort, is required. You can't escape it. You can't slough it off. We have to do it. Lord, I pray as a church, you'd help us to be a people who would do it. Our doors would be open. Lord, the property would be welcoming. And the Spirit of God would always be one here that says we want to nourish and we want to help and we want to encourage. Lord, that's not just for a select few people. That's really an attitude and response all of us should have. And if the disciples didn't have it, you had to show them. And Lord, maybe tonight even as a pastor, you have to show me at times. And it'd have to show us. Lord, help us to have a heart that would listen and a mind that would see this truth and apply it to our own lives this evening. In your name we ask all these things.